Let's talk about gray matter. Oh, 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 what is this? What is this? It's another intro. It's been a while. You all loved those Ink Pulp audio intros. At least a lot of you did. You let me know that. And here I am. It's back. It's back. It's going to be different because I'm different. I've grown. I've got things to talk about. I've got a great episode today. But before that, I want to talk about gray matter. Over the years, as I've been doing this, you know that I've always vented on here. And it just always seemed like there were thoughts just constantly rambling in my brain. In yoga, we call that the monkey mind. It's always going. It's always thinking. And it's, it's, it's relentless. And I think that was, I was having a lot of trouble with that. But through yoga and meditation, I've, I've learned to understand what it is. It's not something you ever get rid of. Um, and it's a good thing when you put it to use properly. But it's, it's, it's something you learn to adapt to. It's something that you understand. So now when the thoughts come in and you start to like grab onto them, you can let go of them. And that's the key is the letting go. It's when you grab on and you pull and pull and obsess and try to get to it, get to it, get to it. And there's this one over here and there's this one over here and you're just clamoring. It just crowds your mind and that's when anxiety sets in for me. And that's when depression sets in for me. And uh, that's something I learned to get a handle of. So one thing I've learned to do uh, on top of meditation is allow the gray matter to do its work. And my mind is a problem-solving machine. I, I, I assume that's true of all of us. And allowing that, to, allowing that machine to do what it does uh, in its best capacity is what I want to get to. So understanding that all these thoughts that were coming at me were my mind trying to figure stuff out and they were they were important things. A lot of some of them were career stuff, some of them were just about art, some of them were just about money, some about family, just all kinds of stuff. All stuff that needs attention, but you can't pay attention to it all at once when it's coming at you. So one thing I've learned to do is put my mind to work before I go to bed. If I'm having one problem, I'll just meditate and focus and try to clear everything out and say this thing. While I'm sleeping, if you could work that out, that'd be wonderful. It could be a creative thought. It could be a story idea. It could be a, a, uh, a, a, a thumbnail. It could be anything. And then a lot of times when I wake up, I might not have the answer immediately, but it comes to me shortly after that. It's like when you're in a shower and your mind just starts to work things out. I don't know what it is about the shower for me, but things just start to appear in front of me. So I noticed um, I found ways to make that gray matter work. And one of the things I did was at the beginning of this virus outbreak, uh, you know, gym's closed and I wasn't going to go without working out, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to be risky. I'm not going to go to the gym, but that's when I took to running outside. And I had been running on a treadmill. It's a different world running outside. It's pain. It's a lot of pain. It's a lot of, a lot more endurance. It takes a lot more endurance and it takes a lot more mental strength. And that's where the episode where me and Jeff DeCow were talking about David Goggins and strengthening your mind. So for the first month, it was just learning to train my mind to know that the pain I was feeling was not serious. Because the mind is like, stop, stop, this doesn't feel good. Just stop, just stop, chill out. And 
so the the first month you spend just saying when your mind says that it's like hey hey ease up ease up we're really only at 25 percent of capacity for pain so when we get up into the 80 range yeah maybe we're we're looking at some uh, injury but right now we're looking at 10 percent 15 percent and what david goggins had said was um when you think you're at your end when you think you're at the injury portion of physical pain you're really probably at 40 percent so you got to readjust your mind so the first month of that was just readjusting my mind. And then the second month, I was finding a little more ease with it and I was pushing myself to go farther. And now I've noticed the pain is minimal. It, it was excruciating at first, but now it's minimal. My mind knows that hey, that's, not, that's not really as high as you think it is. It's low. So now what happens is when I'm running is my mind starts to go other places, not to the pain in my leg. And it just starts to work things out. And as I'm running, I'm working out schedule shit, I'm, I'm, whatever it is that's in my head. It could be a, a story idea. It could be anything, anything. It just it just starts. To, and as I'm running, my uh, that's when my monkey mind starts to go on a thought. But it's, I'm in a position to allow that to happen and the gray matter just starts working as I'm running and I start to get hit with ideas and answers. So for me, running has been a great mode of letting the gray matter work its thing out. But you gotta trust in it. When a problem comes to you, instead of saying, I gotta solve it, I gotta solve it, I gotta solve it, try, try to solve it. But <clears throat> if it's not coming to you immediately, just say, all right, I'm going to let my mind work on this in the background, the subconscious mind. That's where you have to have a little faith and a little trust that it is being worked on, even though you're not thinking about it in the conscious, conscious mind. And the shit works, man. I'm telling you, it just works. Uh, it's worked for me. So my guess is it'll work for you. And I heard it from other people who worked for them. So that's my little talk for today. Um, welcome to the Ink Pulp Podcast. Today, I've got my good friend Eric Canetti. We're going to draw. We're going to talk about some shit. It's very much feeling like now, finally, just my podcast. Ink Pulp Audio, now called the Ink Pulp Podcast. And today's episode with this intro and the new video components, it just feels like the evolution of what I've done. And I feel like everything I've done over these years with this has just been preparation. It's been training and preparation for the next level. And that's where I am. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy all this. You guys, you gals, everyone. I hope you're enjoying these. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, the quality is going to continue to get better and better. I've got all kinds of equipment here. Most of it installed, some not. I've got more coming. So I, I've put a good bit of money into this because I believe the, in this. And uh, now the, I'm going to be coming to the Far Side TV network. I'm excited about that. Uh, there's a lot going on. So um, if you can please just write down below, right, right down there in the YouTube channel. Hit subscribe, please. And oh, I see I didn't turn off my notifications. That's not very professional, Sean. Uh, I also need you to like this post, like all the videos you watch, and comment. Please leave comments. That shit's all good. I'm building something here. I want to build this channel. I want it to be around for a while. I want it to have have a lot of followers. I want it to have. A, I want it to be a powerful force. Uh, I built the audio over the years. Now I want to build the video. So all of you listening to this on Spotify, on iTunes or whatever, please come over to YouTube. You can hit subscribe and play and listen to it the same way. Maybe there's a benefit to just hearing the audio on other platforms. I, I don't know. Um, but my focus is is on the, on the audio and the visuals. And we're going to be be producing some art so the other thing is there's a link below right right down right down in my description there a link to my GoFundMe page this is a, a GoFundMe 
Like last time, a lot of you helped and donated to my GoFundMe and it sent me to Portland to record a bunch of episodes and, we, and uh, one of my favorite seasons ever. And now I'm moving forward and um, seasons are no longer. Now it's just the Inkball podcast. And like I said, there's going to be a bunch of different formats for this. Um, but yeah, the GoFundMe is to help recoup some of the cost of all the equipment I've been putting in. And to hopefully get my man Alan, who puts this together for you all and always has, get uh, get some money in his pocket. Because he's put a lot of energy into this. Um, and I have too. And I've always talked about trying to figure out how to monetize it, but I'm, I'm starting to see it. So if you could, for now, whatever you can spare, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, whatever you have. If you could just go to the GoFundMe and leave that. And, uh, yeah, so if you're not on my YouTube channel and you're hearing this, it's uh, Ink Pulp on YouTube, uh, just like all my social media. So make sure you're following me on, oh, I'm on TikTok now. Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to get it down with TikTok. It's, um, I feel like the old man at the party with that one. But uh, uh, what I'm doing is just filming me creating art mainly. Um, maybe I need to do some stuff like this, some testimonials. I am going to be doing tutorials. They'll be here on my YouTube channel. There'll be some snippets over there too. So please go follow me on TikTok. Make sure you're following me on Instagram and Twitter and here on YouTube. And I, I think that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, I'm enjoying this this new video component, this new intro. I'm gonna be doing it for every episode now. I got I got my fancy glasses on for this. Look and start. Look, you can see the little ring light. Oh, there it is in my glasses. Got a nice little lighting system going on here. My beard, my Jubaka beard, is so fucking out of control. What can I do? What can I do? People aren't trimming beards now, and I get it. We're all wearing masks. I get it. I'm not, I'm not thinking this is fake. I've known too many people have lost people. This shit is fucking real. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out where we're heading with all this. So more on that later. But I'm going to be making like little TV shows with this podcast too. Oh man, shit's going to get crazy. Please, please help me out. Please just go to the GoFundMe. Please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. And enjoy this wonderful episode with Eric Kennedy. Peace. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're 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 good. You're good. So uh so what what's going on with that drawing there? What's going on? <laughs> I was trying <laughs> it's a giant is a giant fucking thigh in a butt. No, I uh I was trying a different rendering style because I'm you know trying to get my inking chops back and I'd realize I kinda have a set thing, a set stuff of like like a how do you say it sean like there, i have like a set way of inking things a default right? like way I, of have, inking. I have i have a go-to yeah exactly right and so i remembered my buddy who his name is byron Penaranda, and he and he was rendering back when we first met a couple pieces with this you know the, the drawings that he had with this rendering style and i didn't know where he got it from until it dawned on me that he's a big shiro fan and this is what this is how shiro is rendering uh, apple seed back in the day and so he was incorporating that but he put his own spin on it right and so yeah and i was like as i was rendering this i was like oh yeah this is what byron used to do so I yeah I, up with I mean i've new, i man. what's that say that again i said i'm not coming up with anything new i'm just taking from people who are taking from people well that's all we're all doing but i i the reason like i think it looks great you're able to capture like an organic uh value shift in it i like i fuck with that sometimes yeah. like i'll use some nibs but my the way my mind works it it makes everything follow i, I don't know if geometry is the right word math is the no, right, right word no that's right you're you're talking about like the volume yeah yeah so like for me it would become very geometric and like uh, like there's a yeah. spontaneous quality to it to where the the marks get a little um unnoticeable and the values become noticeable like with me i think the pattern of the mark making would be very noticeable i'm not saying it wouldn't work uh, that's right. not what i'm saying i'm just right saying, right no just matter what spin. i do i have to 
I have to approach that in my like allow that to just happen because it's how it's how I work. Now, is it because at least in your mind, it makes the most sense? Yeah, that's why the way my okay. mind works, I've come to really understand is I need to understand what I'm doing, understand the reasons of what I'm doing, what it means, like every mark I'm making, what, is the, what does this mark mean? Um, right. Like if I look at someone like Bill Sienkiewicz, like it's, it's visceral. It's, it's almost like, I, it's yeah. not that he doesn't understand what he's doing, but there's yeah. a lot of expression in the mark making and it all right. comes together and makes sense in the totality of the piece. Right. But the way my mind works is not like that. And that took me a long time to understand and accept in myself. Does that make sense? Say, have, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was going to be my next question was that, have you come to terms with it or is it something that you're, you know, continuously strug struggling with, struggling against? I don't, I don't know. No, I don't struggle against it. I embrace it now. I, I, okay. I figure it's me. This is me. This is who I am as an artist. And uh, that's what makes me me. It doesn't mean I, I don't try to push myself to outside of it. It's just a very uncomfortable place, which is a place to practice. But in the end, no matter what I do, if yeah. I find something that works organically, yeah. once I've done it a little bit, Yep. logic starts to creep in and i start to okay <laughs> this is what it means this is why i'm doing it this is right. how it works right and uh i don't mind it's, that it's it's yeah there's some people there's this uh well you know you're using bill sinkovich as an example and far be it for me to analyze that guy's work i don't know him personally i know him in passing and ultimately what i know of him is represented by his work right but it's an interesting point that you bring up when you say like Oh yeah, he works really organically and really viscerally, right? And it reminds me, and and it's in spite of knowing, you know, the the technical nuances of something like like the realistic technical. He it's obvious that he knows why how things work exactly, but he 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 does it in spite of that anyway. You know what I mean? Like right. it adds this spontaneity, whether it be it's his proportions or like the angularity. Or like whatever, right? There's this one great scene. Have you, how long has it been since you've seen that movie, Amadeus? Have you seen it at all? Yeah, I used to love Have that you movie. Seen I haven't seen it in a very long time, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there's this, I, I don't know why that movie sticks out in my mind so much. Most recently, I think I was, I was speaking about this very scene with, uh, with a few of my friends. And, um, you know, I was, there was that scene where uh, Mozart was about to visit, who was he, like the... I want to say the the king of Austria. Remember yes, that? He's played uh, by yeah. Jeffrey Jones. Yes. And, you know, Salieri works for Jeffrey Jones, uh, the, the, the king of Austria, as a music composer, right? He's the okay. court composer. Right. And he had, Salieri had heard of Mozart since like forever. He's the genius, you know? And so upon his arrival, right, he prepared a piece of music. Now, because he is the court composer, naturally he was... Uh, the king of uh, Austria's uh, uh, like teacher, right? right? So as he saw the sheet of music, this th piece that I, I think what's implied is that Salieri was going to play it for Mozart as he walked in, or at least gift it to him, you know? Um, right. The king was like, can I play it as he's walking in? And you know, <laughs> there's this really comical look on Salieri's face who's who's played by uh f murray abraham right he kind of gets this look like oh my god okay your majesty you know you kind of, he kind of has to go along with it right so here comes mozart walking into the i would say the formal courtroom of the king and the king is just banging away at the um, harpsichord and he's messing up it's obvious that he's not a master at it and everything so Salieri is doing these little you know, mannerisms that, that tell him like when to put the emphasis on the notes, right? Anyway, fast forward a couple minutes later, they have their little chit chat, they have their introductions. And there's a bit where he hands the uh, piece of music to uh, the king hands the piece of music to Mozart says, you know, here's a gift from our, our court composer. And uh, he's like, Oh, you can keep it your majesty. I, I you know, I've, you know, I know it already. And he's like, really? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, just upon, like in one hearing, you've, you've memorized it already. And he says, uh, yep, it's all up here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and he goes like, okay, show me. So he gets, he gets out of the way, puts Mozart at the harpsichord. 
and he starts playing it, and this time in the flawless version, as opposed to what the king had done just just all you know two minutes ago, right? Right. And then somewhere in the playing of it, because he's playing it on now, he's just looping it, right? He starts doing a thing where he's like, "Huh, that's clumsy, isn't it?" And that just digs into Salieri, you know, right. who sees Mozart as an undeserving, you know, whatever, like just just a fucking punk, right? Right. And uh, he goes, "That's a little awkward, isn't it?" Right. And so he starts playing it in in and adding to it. And he starts going like, "Wouldn't it be better if it was like this?" You know. And he starts recomposing it on the spot right and then he goes what do you think and he starts playing it even more now he's adding all the mozart's isms into it right and he goes isn't it a little bit more fun if you and he's just changing it left and right you know <laughs> but it, it, you know at its core you're right at its foundation it's still the same piece of music but now it becomes borderline uh unrecognizable because mozart put his, put his stink all over it right and then, you know, it cu- it hard cuts to Salieri on his knees inside his uh, in his in his personal room, thanking the Lord for <laughs> for bringing Mozart into his life or whatever. <laughs> but the point there is that some people can understand something fundamentally understand in this case a piece of music, but let's say Bill Sienkiewicz understand on a fundamental foundational level how a piece of art goes how anatomy goes how composition goes but he does something to it that makes it uniquely his own number one but then ultimately seems like to people who don't know what he's doing he's broken it right oh that anatomy is off Uh, the color composition is really muddy what have you right 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 man there's too many goddamn scratches what have you just not your cup of tea not the stuff that and this is probably unfair, but not the stuff that Salieri had, had put, which is sort of like, if there was a middle of the road, it's right down the, right down the middle, right? Right. But he does it, you know, uh, in this case, uh, Sienkiewicz does it in such a way where you're like, that's recognizably his, you know? Right, right. And, yeah. and a lot of people, um, and I, 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 truth be told, I, I, I can relate to that concept where I'm like, huh, oh, that's a little boring, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but the only way you can break out of that boringness, I think, my, my personal opinion, is that you have to have a, um, what I said before, which is a genuine, true foundational understanding of something before you can start breaking those rules, right? Or before you can start bastardizing it, right? I agree. I think a sure. lot of people skip that middle part, you know? Right, right. I think you, that, oh, at the very least, at the very least, you can tell when they've skipped that middle part. Does that make sense? Yes, Absolutely. I, th- I met like when Bruce Tim kind of became popular in, in oh, the right. comic scene. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I'm a huge fan of what he does and it's obvious he has an understanding, but there was a whole mess of artists who came up like right after trying to look like Bruce Tim, but it was evident they didn't have that understanding. They were just copying the surface of what they saw in Bruce Tim's work. Right. For sure. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. What people fail to realize is, I think maybe what they saw of it was the simplicity, right? right. What they saw of it yes. was the economy of line and rendering, which was next to nil, right? Because Bruce right. designed or drew at least how, how most people have come to know him for like the animated series. If you ever see any of this stuff that he draws for himself or in magazines, or whatever, he's, he's just as detailed as anybody. You know, right, right. Um, you can see his influences left and right. You know, but the stuff that they were pulling from the Batman animated series, what they saw was like, oh, it's not being rendered a lot, and it's Batman. That's kind of cool. What they don't understand is that there's a science to that economy of line, right? Right. I don't think they understood that quite well. They understood the proportion, they understood the execution, but it's when you start putting it all together, especially when like. If if you if you drew a guy punching right or like in that style if you drew Batman punching, um, you could see you could say like if the guy does it well you could say like oh that's definitely on model I know where you took that from you know, but if Bruce were to draw a guy punching in that style that he himself has established which people have extrapolated from, it's totally like not not broken but he takes liberties right 
Right. And the only way he can do that, even within the context of his own style, is because A, he's probably, he's, he's more comfortable with it than anybody else. But he's not beholden by his interpretation of his own style. He's just doing it, right? right. Like he understands the, the nature of how to communicate with those lines, right? Yep. Uh, most people just understand the shape and the form. They understand how they interlock with each other and they understand how to make it on model. And obviously, I would hope that they understand volume. Yeah, that's totally cool. But in order to sell whatever, whether it be weight or an emotion, Bruce draws in spite of what he's are in draws differently in spite of what he's already established for that Batman style. Right. Right. That's pretty fucking awesome. It's totally it's awesome. awesome. Yeah. All right, I think I should introduce us at this point because we've been. Yeah, man. That was a good, good intro. A good. Uh, yeah. It wasn't even an intro, just an, an ease in. So uh, <laughs> let me do my thing for a second. Don't talk so yep. I get, I, I want to steal the mic. I just want my face on, on camera, Eric. <laughs> me and my massive, massive, out of control Chewbacca beard. <laughs> you said Chewbacca? Chewbacca, that's me. Nice, that's nice. the quarantine version of me. Nice, nice. Um, so welcome to the Ink Pulp Podcast. Today... I have one of my very close friends and one of the people who's responsible for this show existing, and that's Eric Canetti. Hello, Eric. Hello, Sean. That's a lot. That's that's way too much credit, man. It's not. You always supported it. You were my first guest. You've always been. Uh, you've been a frequent guest. You mailed me a camera when you thought I that would help me. You, you've done a lot. Anyways. So welcome back, Eric. Thank you for uh, having me. And welcome to the new format. We've recorded with Jeff, you, me, and Jeff. Yeah. But we have not recorded one-on-one, -on -one, and All we right. needed to because now the name is different. It's a whole new thing, and I need you on it in the early stages. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things, uh, one thing I do want to say is you and I recorded one, but I fucked up the files and we have to record again. Right on. So um, if, if I go down some territory, we are, you and I have already gone down. It's just because I think it's stuff that I, I wish, uh, the stuff that I want to have on this episode. Absolutely. But, um, uh, so one thing we're doing today is, and one thing I've been doing on the podcast is trying to pick either an artist, a specific comic, a specific genre or, or whatever for us to draw while mm -hmm. we're talking. And yep. you wanted to, to uh, discuss and uh, pay homage to Jim Lee, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let me, well, and, and specifically in my mind, I, I thought we were talking x-men although we can talk anything so what i did yeah, was i so. i'm gonna go switch my camera over to my table so yeah. i am inking this uh uh see now it's all zoomed in i don't <laughs> know why it's doing that but so i'm inking the this uh cyclops based on his design but that looks good oh, man well thank you with a minor change because i can't draw cyclops all big and muscle bound because he's you're not big on the on the big cyclops oh he's slim he was always right. that was his name yeah, just, yeah so that's what i'm gonna draw let me switch my mic over to there and i'm gonna head over it. to my table let's do it all right how's that yeah that mic sounds sexy man oh yeah that's the i'm all set now i'm all set that, up that's the mic that uh yeah that's the mic that showed up you know like is it? It should be the same as the mic I was just on. No. Really? Huh. Sounds this better. Seems... Maybe because I'm closer. Yeah. To... Oh, there you go. That's probably what it is. Um. So why Jim Lee, Eric? Of all the X Men, of all the X Men that you could draw, you had to draw the only, what I believe to be the only th miss that Jim has, Jim Lee has ever done as far as design is concerned. I can't stand that Cyclops. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of why I, I, <laughs> I say it more tongue in cheekly. I know that people like really super love that. And it's not as if I'm that absolute about anything, but I have a Cyclops of preference and that, that, that is not it. it. It In its time, 
I looked at that Cyclops and I was like, holy crap, that's so fucking cool. I look at it now, I'm like, how does that harness stay up? I don't yeah, understand. Yeah, it's a you know? uh, that's that's kind of why I picked it, just because I'm not I'm not a huge fan of that X Men stuff. Um, the, at the time I was sure, but now I'm, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of that that Jim Lee era stuff. So this kind of sums up to me what that era <laughs> is. <laughs> right, right. Why Jim Lee? Uh, I don't have a good answer. Well, actually, the the it's not necessarily Jim in specific. I have been doing. Uh, I don't know if you've been following my Instagram. If you're not, please do. Um, I have been doing um, uh, a lot of tribute covers from old school comics, you know, or at right. least comics that that stood out to me back when I was still collecting and reading and, you know, su super paying attention. And I, uh, I don't know if I've ever, well, I've, I'm actually doing this probably my second time drawing this Jim Lee cover. But the first time I didn't really have a take on it. I didn't really have sort of like a, an agenda with it, except to say like, hey, I kind of like that. This time I'm kind of like, man, what, what would my take be if I had an opportunity to do, drew that cover? Now, it's, it seems disingenuous because Jim did all the heavy lifting. But nonetheless, here we are. Like, and I've done it for a handful of things for, um, like from artists from like Jack Kirby and... Uh, and um, who else did I draw? I can't. I can't remember. J. Scott Campbell. I just finished for his Gen Thirteen. His limited series run yeah, on Gen I saw Thirteen. That. Um, um, I, yeah. So there was a there was a hand. There was a Gil, Gil Kane one for that super famous uh, Punisher Spider Man cover where he's looking right. at Spider Man through the uh, the crosshairs. So yeah. Um, so Jim Lee was I don't know in a way next you know because he the, this cover in specific stood out to me as a kid. Right. It was it, so that was the only sort of uh, that's only that's the only rule is to say like oh did that speak to me at all? Do I remember it? Did I want you know like oh did that have a profound impact on me looking at something on the stands? You know. Right. Right. You did a McFarlane one. That's the other one you did. Yeah. I did. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, that. which cover is it in specific that you're doing? This one's for uh, the Uncanny X Men two sixty eight. It's the Black Widow. Um, Captain America and Wolverine one. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, it's badass. But people are, I think, in the handful of times that I've seen people pay tribute to this cover, the one thing that they never incorporated, at least by way of intent, uh, in contrast to the original cover, they never actively landed the lighting that Jim was trying to go for. There's supposed to be this up lighting on, on Wolverine, yeah. Or on, on the whole scene, actually. He cheats a couple times, and I think that's a pretty good creative call. But for the most part, there's this lighting that people aren't trying for. I'm going to see if I could pull that off, or at least be more deliberate about how to render it. So you've seen a lot of people pay homage to that cover? <sighs> yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't be I mean, I don't know about a lot, but a handful, and I'm not surprised, only because like it's a pretty dang, it's a pretty striking cover. It's like you know, Spider-Man. Did you see it like on right? published books or, or is it just yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at reference right now as we speak online. If you were to plug that in, there's like, there's the, um, oh gosh. Uh, most recently, Scott Williams just did it for a cover of X Factor. Right. Now, did he ink the original one? I think he did. I think it, that's a signature in the bottom right hand corner if I'm looking at it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty fucking cool, man. Anyway, you have a little bit of time. I'm going to stop. We can chit chat, but I'm going to continue your draw. Okie dokie. So, um, that's how's this been for you, by the way? How's uh, the, how's the launch? How's the, you know, or the relaunch, I should, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel comfortable uh, calling it a, a relaunch because it really isn't. A rebranding, I okay. guess. It's really, what I did was, I mean, what's new is the fact I have a video component. So when it, when it, this quarantine thing first hit and you sent me the camera and I started recording, I was like, actually, this is good because I don't, I think I need to talk about this. Thank yeah. you for asking. There's gonna, um, there may be a bark in the background. It's my dog. That's, that's fine. My, my studio space. Don't worry but anyway. about it. 
but uh, the the reason I never did like okay. Skype or anything like that for the podcast was because I um I I always felt like and, and I know this from experience that when you're interviewing over the internet and you're on a computer there's a, a ton of distractions going on and as you know I like to have these pretty intimate conversations that can get very personal or and re whatever revealing whatever and I, f I just felt like it was very impersonal to do it through the internet um, and I remember one of the things that inspired me to have a podcast to begin with was the time we would spend in artist alley drawing next to each other and and just shooting the shit and chatting and i remember yeah. thinking like it would be interesting to capture these conversations and that's what the podcast spawned from so when the quarantine hit and we started streaming with jason I was like, oh, this feels kind of like a convention now. And then I started thinking, I was like, oh, well, if we're drawing and recording over the internet that way, it's different than just sitting in front of a computer with distractions. Like we're actually engaged in the conversation and the drawing. Right. And I thought it also offered the audience something interesting to, to uh, something new and interesting to see in the podcast, which was the guests creating artwork while talking. Sure. So. Uh, when it happened, I created season eight for the podcast was when I thought the podcast would then be about taking trips to various areas outside of conventions and recording because mm -hmm. conventions had become problematic for recording. You're right. In and, what way? Uh, Just it, people's I, schedules? Yeah. Schedule, getting everyone's schedules to line up. Um, conventions had become busier and busier and busier and uh, people were just getting pulled in a million directions and uh, they were also getting more exhausting to do. So to have the energy to podcast, which it does take some energy to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't working. I remember I'd line up like three or four and I'd be lucky if I got one and even that, right. you know, and, and then I'd be like, well, I'm kind of glad I didn't get any more because I'm wiped out. But that is it, if, it must well, impact their energy as well. Whoever it is that you, you have on the show, right? Like, sure. They're probably exhausted from the weekend. And, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I decided to take a trip to Portland, had to go fund me for that and figured I'd catch people in their home studios or wherever in their hometown. And without the pressure of a convention, it would be really relaxed and fun. And it was, I had some great conversations and did some of my favorite podcasts and kind of felt rejuvenated as a right podcaster. On. That's so awesome. Then the virus hit and it was like, okay, that's not going to work this year. Right. Um, so that's when I kind of came up with the idea of doing what we're doing now that's and great. immediately created season nine for ink pulp audio, called it the quarantine Chronicles, created a YouTube channel that yeah. was linked to some old Gmail account I had like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And then after like recording like a, a grip of episodes because I just went into record mode. I didn't even think like, I didn't think it through. I just said, this feels right. I'm going to do it and just put my whole self into it and recorded yeah. a bunch of them. I had luckily, thanks to you, I had a good camera, but I, I didn't have a good mic. So then I got a good mic and then I didn't right. have good lights. So I got good lights. And then I realized the time <laughs> I was spending in front of the computer where you can see my face. I didn't have a good camera there. One's coming. Right. I didn't right. have a good mic. I got a mic. I got lights. So right, right. my whole studio has changed and it's really interesting to see. It's like a TV. You went studio. down the rabbit, the rabbit hole of equipment. I did, basically. Thanks to you. you <laughs> I'm sorry. dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad I did. But so then I was like, all right, this is going to be the, my, the future of things. And I knew I had said to myself at um, sometime last year, that I wanted to really up my video content because I knew that's where um, things would be heading in terms of like content and people wanting content, more and more video stuff. Right. So I knew I'd be heading down that rabbit hole. I just hadn't made the plan yet. So this mm. kind of like just 
forced me into it and I'm glad great. it did. Great, great. So I created that YouTube channel and then after doing a bunch of episodes and realizing this is going to be something I'm going to be doing for a long while now. Yeah. Um, I was like, I, I need to get the good equipment. So I started to do that. <laughs> and then right. I'm, I'm doing a job, um, an art job right now for a rap group. I'm a huge fan of and have been since I was 21 when they first. Are you at Liberty out. to say the group? Yes. Yeah, the far side. Oh, right on. Congratulations, man. Oh, That's thank great. you. So I've been working with them. Uh, it happened right before the virus, and every Monday I have a Zoom conference with um, a member of the Far Side that I deal with, and um, the the DJ who's producing this song. And I'm doing it's not just a cover I'm doing for them; it's a it's a whole bunch of of visuals and branding and merchandising and really an interesting project. Yeah. So they have something called Farside TV, which is an internet channel where they air podcasts. And Holy shit, that's I right. remember when they, all, they said they wanted to do this job with me, I was like, it'd be cool if I get in good and then I can try to see if they'll carry me on, on their network. But they asked me before I could even ask them if I wanted to come Perfect. over. Perfect. So I was like, okay, the, uh, this yeah. is all pointing in the right direction. But then I realized my YouTube channel wasn't under the same name as all my social media. And I wanted to have mm. that consistency. So yeah. I created a new YouTube channel. My other one had been up for, I think, three weeks. And it was growing quickly. I got up to 267 with um, like seven episodes. Yeah. Um, so um, I remember I was talking to Alan, who does all my audio production and stuff and he agreed it was the right thing to do he's like i hate to see all those followers and views go away i was like i think we'll get that back pretty quick yeah so yeah. i created the new channel it's all under ink pulp and i'm at 217 as of today and this channel's been go, up for about two weeks so there you now go. it's about building and when i launch right. with the far side what will happen is a, an episode will premiere with them on a Thursday night, and I'll release it on my YouTube channel Friday morning. Oh, good. That was going to be my question, was that it's not exclusive to... No, no. They were like, they didn't want exclusive. They just wanted to air it. Like, they were just... That's great. What I was doing and wanted to be... That's pretty cool, it. man. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. They're really cool dudes. And I, I, we have, like, just talking to them, they've said it and I've said it. Like, we've connected in such a way that we're not... It's not just about this project anymore. We're building other ideas together for future stuff. That's great. So that's been exciting. All good news, buddy. Congratulations. Thank you. So, um, and my goal is to release two episodes a week, one on the Far Side Network, which like on those ones, I'll have people on where we'll have some element of hip hop talk, at least in the beginning, right. because people are going to go to the Far Side TV network knowing who the far side is and they're a hip hop group. So right. um, makes sense. Uh, so the other episode <clears throat> put out on my channel on the other days, but also uh, it's not just going to be the interview podcast. That won't be all I'm putting up. I'm going to put up little tutorials on there. Um, I'm going to make like little, I really like there, there are certain like reality shows. I don't know if you call them reality shows, that I really enjoy. And mm -hmm. there's like David Chang's Ugly Delicious. Um, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. There uh, is um, John Favreau's The Chef Show. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. Action Bronson's Fuck, that Del Fuck That's Delicious. And there's Eddie Wong's Wong's World. And I want it like, so when we go to conventions, when that comes back to our life, yeah. I want to, I got that camera you're using right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to film just like, you know, whatever Comic-Con we're at, just elements of us at the show, eating dinner, awesome. making That's like awesome. a little show. And that'll be an episode of the podcast. Great. Great. So, Brilliant. And then the th other thing I'm going to do is I've told Basically you what you're saying is, uh, Eric, lose weight, you fat ass. You're going to be on camera soon. You went I there you. so fast. I get it. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking that. Although, no, I, did, did you like my fancy glasses when I was first talking? Yeah, I dug it, my man. Face? I got I those. Uh, the first few times on camera, 
I mean, look, we're in quarantine. My shit is out of control. My beard needs to trim. <laughs> so bad. I mean, my hair was terrible, but my wife shaved a mohawk into it, so right. Like, I need I need to to look a little better on camera, so I got those fancy glasses. At the moment, there's a camera component. Everybody goes. Everybody straightens up a bit, right? Like everybody's sort of yeah. like, you know, uh, you know, tucks their shoulders back and sticks their chests out or whatever it is, right? The <laughs> yeah. most flattering, the most flattering fucking version. It's, it's so strange. Like if we're just kind of chit chatting in the room, like in the past, right? You you turn your recording equipment on and who gives a shit people are in their right. boxer just hanging right, out right, you know what right. i mean totally, drinking or whatever totally. the moment you say i swear to god moving for just be prepared for this you like people are going to start asking for dude you need to tell me like a couple of days ahead of time i need to cut my hair i need to fucking do push-ups <laughs> right, whatever it is right, right, right. that's yeah. fucking coming you know i'll give because, you a heads up i'll give you a heads again up. the moment there's a video component <laughs> it changes people's um it changes. It, it's strange. It has it has a deep, uh, um, uh, I would say, psychological uh, nuance to it, right? I'm going to be on camera. People are going to be able to see my mannerisms. Yada yada yada. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. And funny. yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about that a lot. I'm going to be on this Far Side Network. I'm going to be doing a lot of video stuff, making these instructional videos. I gotta gotta make sure my shit is tight. <laughs> yeah, you're fine, dude. You're, in, I think, as as far as I would say, your overall health. It's, it's, you know, you you haven't been as healthy in a long, long time, right? Yeah. Physically, I'm, it yes. looks like you've gotten yourself super trim. Yes, yes. Right? I, I'm in, I'm in the best health I've been in. I, my 40s, I'm in much better shape than I was my 30s, mm -hmm. for sure. And so you're in a good spot. It's all the uggos that you're going to have on your show. <laughs> it's what? It's all the uggos that you're going to have as guests that they need to fucking. <laughs> I'll just have Mateo on a lot and I'll look real good. All the time. Yeah. I think that's, pre that's a criteria, right? Like who do I need to bring on to make me look good? <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, I was so what I was talking about the switch. So yeah, I mean, oh, the instructional line. Uh, I'm I'm starting to film in a few weeks my first instructional uh, video that I'll be selling, and I'm gonna do a oh, whole yeah? series of them. Yeah, that's great. And I'm gonna do a whole series of them, and I'm gonna try to get as many of my friends that will want to do one to do one with me. Absolutely. And we can all hopefully make a little money and offer some good education at a much cheaper rate than art school offers. And hopefully awesome. at a much more success rate. Holy shit. It's about to storm like crazy outside. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I just this looked out my window. The trees are like swaying like crazy and it's pitch black. This time of year for your side of the world. Yeah, dude. It's summer storms are crazy mm. in the South. They're, they're quite beautiful. If you're, if you can watch them from yeah. a safe safe distance <laughs> um, safe barricaded distance yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but they're pretty intense they usually don't last very long though but this is a season four is what you're saying uh yeah yeah it's uh it got really warm um very fast in the past couple of days today's like 85 so when that happens it, they're coming all right I mean, like the spring showers last for days, but they're not intense. The su thunderstorms right. in the summer are crazy. Um, crazy stuff. Yeah. So the other thing is uh, when I'm making these instructional videos, a component yeah. of them is going to be my Ink Pulp audio style interviews on okay. camera. Oh, um, okay. Not drawing, but just one-on-one. -on -one. And so I will be releasing those on the, on the uh, YouTube channel. So wait, what does that mean? You're just like kind of sitting with a guy, camera yeah. on, chit chat. Yeah, oh, okay. just like just like we do at a con, but the, well, I'll be filming it. But I'll I'll be traveling to people's home studios to record. I got you. And and also I want it to be like a a show, not just an instructional video. So I want to like right, right, right. Let's say I was coming to you in, out, yeah. out where you live. Yeah, uh, I'd be like, where do you like and call to call the police? No. <laughs> i'd be like where do you like to go what do you like to do is there a place you like to eat do you like to go for walks and sure sure and we would do some of that stuff and record us doing it and talking chit-chatting a little bit there 
but then you and I would sit down either in your studio or your living room, we'd light it well and film that interview portion. It, it would probably be, um, I don't know, but I'm guessing it would be shorter than the ink pulp art, like these style of interviews where we go longer, maybe mm -hmm. it'd be like a half hour, 45 minute thing, mm -hmm. because we'd be doing, we'd spend so much energy filming the teaching part also. <laughs> right. So. Right, it would right, be right. like a little show. That's awesome, man. You think? That's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's ambitious, but that's never it been, that's ambitious. never held you back, right? No. It's always been sort of the... Why do you have... You, all, <laughs> you point things out to me in a way that make me feel like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Listen, think it was that ambitious, but... Up here my, what do you call it? How I broadcast things is, is independent of how you receive things, you know? Yeah. That was a the tone that I put behind that was like, Hey, that's ambitious. And it's awesome. You're like, Whoa, what the heck is it ambitious? Oh, maybe I should rethink this thing. That's all on you. That's all on me. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I don't, I, I mean, I've, I've come to know this about myself and it's, it's made me fall on my face a lot, but they've taught me a lot of lessons is I get an idea and I just do it yeah. and I just figure out how to make it work. Yeah. And when it doesn't work, I learn. I used to get really like upset and like beat myself up over it. But now I'm like, oh, okay. What did I learn from that? Yeah. And moving forward, how can I put that to use? Yeah. I mean, like, what's so bad about like that failure? You know, like there's, right? First of all, the attitude is great, which is like, oh, hey, what did I learn from that? But ultimately, I don't think, I think it's just, you know, how for what how, for whatever reason i guess depending on what family you're in but for whatever reason people have put an intense disfavorable concept on failure right 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 and and it's it's mind boggling because i grew up with it too right hey you should oh you know you know uh uh it's there's always this like stigma attached to not being the best at something Right. Right. And this, this is not an excuse to, to try not to try your best. That's some, that's an, that's a con that's not right. Part right. Of this conversation. Right, but right. the idea that should you come up short of expectation, that exercise or that whole attempt was null and void. That's dumb. <laughs> you know, I agree. Right? Like, I like, agree. There's I... so many things that you can walk away from uh, failing at something, or there's so many things that you can take away from failing at something, right? Maybe not as much as the victory. Cause I, there's a part of me that believes like victory is, you know, especially with the right sort of training, with the right sort of preparation, that's the, that's the expectancy, right? So when you win, you're like, oh, what did I learn from that except for everything that I've been training for for months now, you know, right, like, of right. course, that's, that, that's what was going to happen. But when you lose, it takes a different kind of mentality to go like, okay, where is the opportunity space there? And most people just abandon it as like, oh, look at all that time wasted. No, it's just one, one extra layer, you know, one subdivision of a concept, one, one subdivision of an exercise. Yeah. I, I mean, I've come to, everything you're saying is what I've come to learn because I used to beat myself up. But now I'm like, like my attitude now is failure is your greatest teacher. So, and, and I remember like I was raised to think you shouldn't fail. But yesterday, my advice to my daughter when she said, she had failed in something i was like well i said that failure is your greatest teacher what did you learn and how can you put that knowledge towards use moving forward and if you do so nothing was lost right right and uh, there's so much that. more to gain than just the the stoppage of a concept right which is like oh i I prepared, I did everything that I could, I fell short of my own expectation, therefore, no, it, this is all worthless, right? Or, right. you know, obviously, it's going to be disappointing, right? There's, that's, that's not even, that's, that's built into the experience, if you, are, you fall short of the, fall short of expectation, but to say that failure is a finite version of it, eh, cool. Yeah, I agree. You know? I agree 100%. But again, that's all stuff I've learned over the past couple of years, and I've grown tremendously. Now, that doesn't mean that the, this new format's going to fail, Sean. That's not what I'm implying. No, no, I, I'm not taking it that way. <laughs> I'm just I mean, kidding. Too. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do way. it, and I'm just going to keep doing it. At this point, I'm just in a position where I, I don't have a choice. I have to do it. I've I was going to say, you're pretty myself. committed. Yeah. You know? 
but I'm excited. I'm, I'm very excited. I, I'm looking at a future where I am very much in charge of my own destiny. I'm making, I mean, figuring out how to monetize it is my next thing, but I'm making yep. my living not um, being a slave to deadlines or uh, all the stuff that I had so much pressure on myself from before. That's a dream. I yeah. Think. And some that's, people, that's, yeah, you're right. Some people thrive well at, under deadline, right? Some people look for, um, an external source to tell them that the work is done or whatever, right? A, an external validation that, you know, something is worth it, right? right. Deadlines help facilitate that concept, right? Sure, sure. Um, and that's okay, but there are some people who, who don't do that, right? And I'm glad to learn that you're taking a jab step because that's in a more ambiguous space. That's actually, I would think... I would suggest that it's significantly more scary, right? Because it's, it's at least for you, for your own personal experience, it's untried, right? Like right. everybody can say, oh, I've done my, I've done the whole, you know, self-sustaining, self-starting thing, but that's their experience. None of that right. is immediately transferable, right? Except for the, ex except for the first step, right? Which is I'm going to go do it, right? That's the only thing that, is immediately 100% guaranteed a one-to-one -one transferable experience. Everything else may have nuances of similarity, but it won't right. necessarily be like, oh, dude, when you do this, it's definitely going to be this, right? Right, right. Well, I, and also, I, I mean, to be honest, the deadline thing was, was fine. It wasn't the pressure. I just wasn't making, in comics, I wasn't getting anywhere. I was just constantly struggling financially and working constantly yeah and it was stepping yeah. back and being like okay you, you've basically been spinning this wheel running in this wheel now trying to get somewhere for how long and you're not yeah. getting anywhere yeah so it's time to readjust course and right i i it was kind of like you say you put things out there to the universe and it listens, but that's also around the time when work started drying up for me. Like the, the jobs just stopped coming in, which sure. was good because it kind of forced me to be like, all right, what can you do? Yeah. What yeah. Can, how can you make this all work? And so that's where I am. And I'm, I'm finding ways to do it for the past year. I've, I've, I think in 2019, I drew a total of, under 30 pages gross especially if that's your livelihood right like yeah i mean it wasn't a great year fine i but i ended up making more that year than i did the previous few years working full-time doing pages are you kidding no i'm not it doesn't math out in my head at all well because i was finding other well eric oh well, i get you i got you I comics got you. doesn't pay well all right, right. Do you agree with that? <laughs> yes. Okay. So <laughs> in doing, doing what we do, there are other avenues to find ways that pay you more what you're worth. I mean, I get you. I started doing some, some design work and I was, I quoted a, like what um, a concept artist would call a day rate, which was mm -hmm. much higher than anything comics ever paid. And sure. I got it. And right. I got some illustration work that paid well. Um, it was it was a tough year financially, but the year before was was brutal. It was brutal, right? Um, but now I'm I'm looking. It's funny this whole quarantine thing. I, I it's made me grow a lot, and I'm looking ahead at what seems to be a lot of good things. That's amazing, man. Not just obviously the the series of events, but your overall attitude towards it. Yeah, and that was I mean that was what I spent 2019 really doing was working on myself and listening yeah. to self help books and talking Super to people smart. And, and thinking and meditating a lot. Yeah. And, uh, Here's the thing: if you've you know you were talking earlier, this was like a couple of minutes back. You were talking about like you know, you weren't really, at some point, the, the comics work dried up, right? And I, and I don't think that's in 100%. Um, uh, it's not, not even a, that shouldn't be some of this, um, 
it shouldn't be this weird anomaly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because, because comics, I don't think is in the business of growth. It's in right. the business of maintenance, right? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, it's in the business of just like making sure that the standards that we, they've established for themselves moving forward or, you know, in the past, continue to sustain them moving forward, right? Nothing wrong with that. I mean, like right. Pepsi doesn't need to change for me to enjoy Pepsi, right? Right. Um, as long as they're honest with themselves in as far as uh, uh, that's what their goals are, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think it's, it's, it's exclusively unique to you that comic book work dried up. If they are in the business of maintaining whatever preconceived notion they have of success, right? Perhaps the, your participation in it was less critical, right? Because I think you're, you are trying to, you're trying for growth, right? Right. You're trying for exciting new things that, that still sort of like, not just going beyond just like, you know, monetary, right? Personal sustenance, that kind of thing, right? Like right. financial uh, financial stability, which right. I don't know anybody who, why, why would anybody get into comics if they wanted financial stability? Yeah, I, I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, first mistake. But like, but like beyond that, you wanted to be involved in projects that really sort of blew your skirt up, right? For yeah, I did, I did. And it's unfortunate that rare is the occasion where comics is in the business of doing any of that you know right again they're in the business of maintenance and again there's that's not that's not as that's not a slight that's an observation right, right. That's an observation based on performance you know um right. it's rare that they'll put a project out there that is outside of left field i was just listening to and and uh and reflecting on you know darwin cook just passed uh yeah. well had passed but his his um anniversary of his death the anniversary the anniversary that just passed yeah and people were on social media talking about their experiences with him right yeah and and i read up i was like oh i knew darwin from you know when we worked with each other on men in black and that was like the beginning way in the beginning of my career when he transferred I over think from I warner realized brothers realized you knew him i i was very good friends with darwin but go ahead go ahead i didn't yeah know. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, but I, what I knew of him was like Warner Brothers. What I knew of him was that when he moved over to Sony, you know? Right. And I didn't know of his work as it was coming out in comics or his like, you know, his story of like how he wanted to become a comic book artist. It's all of that stuff. Right. Uh So I read up on it a little bit and I was like, oh, that's really super fascinating. And the one thing that stood out to me was, uh, uh, was that really notable run that he had for New Frontier. Right. And how sort of, how it sounded, again, and not having any personal experience with it, how it sounded to be like, he was just as as un- uncompromising creatively with that book as much as possible. And yeah. he had a group of people on the, detor- on the editorial side that was, you know, was backing him up, right? Right. Now, some people might know the nuances of that more intimately, but, you know, obviously they can come in and tell me differently. But my point is that at some point in our in in the in the history of comics, they were still doing things like New Frontier, right? Right. They were still trying things out like that, and I don't know if there is a current uh, uh, a a current version of that, a current representation of just like yeah, let him go define an unlit part of the transition from the golden age to the silver age you know right right yeah is that yeah, still I think happening? You're right I know. i've been i've been i mean i think they touch, right i think they give people that sort of freedom but it's not an artist i think they do give it to certain writers oh interesting um oh. and uh I, but i don't think there i just don't think there are a lot of writers today that truly understand the medium and the craft hmm um and i think it's just more about the fact that that writer is very popular and will sell some books sure Sure. more than that makes sense too though there's right right but it's not it's like new frontier was about creating a piece of artwork yeah and i think the other the other um stuff they do now is more about just selling some books and moving the needle temporarily I i think it's like 
they're caught in a hard place, right? Because, because if you're in the business of maintenance, you are, you suddenly become risk averse, right? <laughs> because, right. you know, the nature of maintenance is you don't try to introduce new Coke, right? right like that's just right. insane. You're fucking, your, your fan base would riot. So more of the same, but just enough change to say that there's a difference that's, that was made, you know? Right. And that's a weird place to be in, man. I mean, even the con, right? So, like, Darwin didn't necessarily reinvent superheroes. He just told a really, really good portion of their history, you right. know? So, it was safe in such a way that, you know, um, it was safe in such a way that he wasn't really sort of like, hey, let's reestablish the entire, the entire uh, universe, right? Um, right? Let's just tell a really, really good story of the universe that we already come to know. So I think that's where opportunity space, uh, as far as opportunity space is concerned, there's a there's a missed there there's a missed opportunity there, right? right. Because like what keeps happening and it are all of these series wide, if not label wide, relaunches, not realizing that doesn't really make for good stories because that it, that exercise is about garnering new readership, yeah. Right. And if you're in the business of maintenance, that's <laughs> counterintuitive, you know, right. um, it's a great attempt to understand like, okay, we need to grow. We need to bring in more people. Sure. That's, that's gallant. But in as far as like understanding your company's identity, it might not be ideal if all if people expect just Coke from you. Don't try new Coke. New Coke is going to fail, <laughs> you know? Um, but in doing so, <laughs> Yeah, identify opportunity space as Darwin did to go like, yeah, that's really good. That's a really, really good space for us to tell good stories. And Sandman right. existed long before Neil Gaiman got his hands on it, right? But he told good stories within that universe anyway, or at least within that, you know, within the, the quote unknown, right? The gray area uh -huh. and, look at, and look at it now, you know? Yeah. I think it's just... Um, there may be a stewardship issue, right? I'm trying to understand that stewardship, stewardship is like, who are the people who are heralding in those kinds of projects? Right. You know, who are, who are responsible for understanding, forecasting, and implementing um, exciting new projects, right? Is there somebody? Is there somebody responsible? Is there somebody that's been tasked to do that? I, the answer I is no. That's yeah. that's another missed opportunity. You know. I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly don't know. But I, I I would. I mean, maybe at DC, you've I think Mark Doyle with the black label. That's oh sure his job over there. But I, that right. might be about it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That said, I don't know if work drying up was uh, as as big an anomaly, which which I don't think you've identified as an anomaly. It's just dried up, right? Right. Like I don't know if that was like strictly uh, like independent, uh, or excuse me, strictly exclusive to you. Right. I think there was a there's a there's a shift in how comics are being published with the idea of attempting something new, but I think fully realizing that they have to maintain, you know, classic Coke, Coke, Coke classic. Right, and uh, that's kind of what, uh, from the people that would talk to me, would my work was just too different. And that was yeah. something I always heard, you know, when I was trying to break in, uh, too cartoony, too this, too that, not, not house style, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that was always something I was very proud of. I, I didn't want to be yep. that. Yeah, that's a badge of honor, that. in my opinion. Yeah. What? That's a badge of honor, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Um, it made life harder for me financially. Yeah. But yeah. I didn't want to turn what felt right into just a job. Like, I yeah. didn't want to just start like tracing photos and making photorealistic comics to get a paycheck that's not why yeah. i i followed art for a living i, I don't Everything, know that's, wait go ahead yeah i was gonna say it's a strange short sort of um 
um, cultural shift depending on who is in the front office, right? Like right. as I'm sitting here drawing this Jim Lee tribute, you know, um, right. Jim is the amalgam of what he'd identified as the most successful artists in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. Like as far as his style was concerned, he took, you know, John Byrne, he took Neil Adams, he took like a bunch of people that he, he really super liked. And he was, I, I think I've heard stories and who, so, so please keep in mind, this not, might, might not be 100% true. I heard stories that he actually went into a level of analysis, like, okay, so who's good out there? And who is the guy, who are the guys that I can, that I can, you know, use as influence to help with my, you know, to help with a more um, um, appealing portfolio, right? Really? I, that's how I heard this story. Right, 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 right. Might be wrong. Might be just fiction. But let's say. I mean, it wouldn't right? surprise it, me. He's pretty um, savvy business guy. So if he, he really is at it that way. That wouldn't surprise me. Right. And so, if that were, if that is true, then it it goes to show that, you know, there was a geo, there was a version of our history in, in comic book history that allowed for like different different voices, you know, and to think that he was also just as responsible for, at least when it come, came to labels that he was in charge of, he was also responsible for sort of filtering out those voices and saying like, draw as close to me as possible. It's kind of, it kind of makes me laugh, oh, right? that's a really good point. Did he, so was that something he would have said? What, like draw exactly like me? Yeah. No, but uh, what I'm looking at is is the proof that's uh, you know the proof sure. that was this sure. publishing endeavor over at Wildstorm and when he was right, at Image, right? right? right. Like yeah. the people that were getting hired on were uh, I wouldn't go as far that would be go, go as far as to be as harsh to say that they were Jim Lee clones, right. but their Jim Lee isms made a lot of you know there were a lot of there were a lot of like tangential isms in there, right? Like oh that's right. definitely a Jim render, that's definitely a Jim face, that's definitely a right. Jim pose, right? Which isn't I, I, in that at that stage in his career, if people are are if he's trying to launch a set of books and in hopes of making a company that's successful, it made sense to bring on people who kind of mimicked him because he was successful, right? Right. So it's strange. Now now how does that reflect to now, right? There must have been some sort of general uh, um, sentiment that whatever style is prevalent now is a thing that's working, right? Right. You, cu right. you couple that <laughs> with, uh, well, you couple that with a handful of editors who have their own uh, preferences, right? Mm -hmm. Stylistically. Um, um, and I think that's how you land into whatever Marvel books look like now, right? Right. That's probably informed by who, whoever the heck sells, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right with that. Absolutely freaking lutely right about that. So there was a point for you, I am pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, where you were pursuing comics as a full-time thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, I still love comics. I just don't like the business of it anymore. Right. And that's what, that's uh, me too. And I'm not, all this stuff I'm doing is not to say I'm going to stop making comics. It's to say that all of this is to allow me the financial freedom to make comics my way. Right. And comics that I want, I love. Like you said, comics that make my skirt fly up. Right. So. Yeah, no, at one point, I really, really loved com I mean, I wanted to get into business of comics. I loved it so much that I applied as much as I could to myself as far as pressure, as far as like maintaining, um, uh, maintaining some kind of regimen where I was like drawing, trying to draw comics all day. When I finally broke in, I had, this, you know, coincidentally enough, I got the same, same note as you, which is like, oh, this doesn't look like, you know anything you know this was in the era of the jim lee hires you know right um and that was that was a a tough um pill to swallow but uh like i said to you eventually that's i started wearing that as a badge of honor you know right it just made getting jobs harder <laughs> right exactly exactly but right? you 
you were is this after your time at Wildstorm you're talking about or no before? so so yeah I want to go back to to um, not amend but obviously add on to what I just said because at one at one stage in Wildstorm's incarnation it was about like hey who are the guys that kind of look like Jim? Who are the guys? But eventually Wildstorm grew out of that, you know? So I don't want it to seem like all Wildstorm ever was was Jim Lee wannabes or like Jim Lee guys, right? right? Because by the time I got there, it was as diverse, I think, as you could have possibly been. It was Dustin Wynn. It was like Carlos Dand. It was Lee Bermejo. It was Ali Garza. Right. It was and that's Jim. when it was I like, got my first job, which was at Wildstorm. Yeah. So, so there you go. There was like, it had already sort of matured away from that formula, right. Of like, you know, Jim's, Jim's looks sells Jim's books. Right. right. So it got away from that. And I think that, so that's when it really sort of transformed into what I think was the grander, I think more, more holistic approach that Wildstorm took, which is like, dude, if it's good, we're on board. And that was also Jim, right? Like, right. because I doubt I doubt that I would have gotten anywhere near working for that company, especially in-house, because that's what Dustin and I were. We're, we're technically in-house artists. There was no way we would be in there if uh, Jim didn't approve of it, right? And he was right. so supportive of my work in the time that I had spent in that studio. So I don't have any disparaging things to say to him about him. Right. You know? But yeah, I, I really wanted to get into comic books industry or i did i'd broken in but then the 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 dollars and cents just didn't add up i was just not fast enough for it to make sense right um uh, yeah i was just not fast enough for it to make sense to continuously do it right was it were were, did you ever hit a point where you're like i could go faster but i wouldn't be able to sit with the work i've done no no i just wasn't smart enough you know I just was not smart enough to come to those to that conclusion. Even as many people that were telling me, "Hey, you could probably get away with less," right? Right. And I was like, "See, like, like you know, the way you phrased that question made it seem like it was a a personal attitude towards craft, right? It wasn't. I would have implemented. I would have loved to have done it faster if I just knew how to. Right. Right. Yeah. I just didn't know how. And that sounds crazy. That sounds like, oh, how just draw less lines. No, it wasn't that at all. It's like, how can I execute this look that I'm going for if what I'm opting for is less work, right? Right. Now, looking back, I'm like, nah, that, that, was, that was inexperience and youth that was preventing me from taking full advantage of that situation. What would because you there was a way different? To, uh, I would have done that style. <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have done that look that I was doing for Cybernaria. The stuff that I was doing for Wildstorm, I wouldn't have done that at all. First of all, I was again that bullheadedness allowed my style and look of my work to mature to the point where it was a rec- it was recognizable, right? Right. But that shouldn't be, especially if you're in the business of making money for comic book publishers, right? And ultimately making money for yourself that shouldn't be the only guiding principle, you know, it should yeah. be on the list for sure. It should be right up there, but it shouldn't be the only thing that makes you go like, yeah, I'm stylistically different. And you know, I'm unique and people can see me as like, dude, you still have a, you still have a responsibility to your publishers, you know, right. to be able to put this stuff out and actually have it bring in the kind of uh, uh, income, right. And revenue that they need to continue to publish this, especially with you in tow. And if I had that level of maturity, the way that I'm talking about it now, I wouldn't have done that style, right? If I had any other style to implement, I, would have, I wouldn't have done that style. But back then, it's all I knew because I'd worked on it for so long, right? right. I, had read, um, I had read so many stories or multiple stories about Paul Smith implementing that super simple style that he did for X-Men, Uncanny X-Men during his run, right? Mm-hmm. And I heard it from him directly right? He's, he's one of my big heroes, right? And he said, in order to maintain, because X-Men was the book to get back in the day, if you were a Marvel artist, right? right. Like the, you graduated to that book, you know? And yeah. when he finally got it, he was like, shit, in order for me to maintain this monthly schedule, 
right? I have to use a style that allows me to get this book out on time, right? Right. And can you imagine that the level of business savvy that I never had, you know, to be like, I, hey, this is monthly. I need to get this out. Um, I remember like I was in situations like that where I was offered jobs where I was like, I'd have to move a lot faster. But I also was never confident enough in my craft to be able to move fast, to do work. Fa like I would try to do faster work and I'd be like, OK, yeah. I can do it, but it looks like shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean that was a big part of it for me was like I'm just not able to create work that I can stand behind. Yeah. At that no, I guess I mean I understand that. I mean that's where your that's where your question was coming from. Right. I didn't even have that level of self awareness. I just didn't have a gear that I could shift into uh that I felt comfortable enough, you know felt comfortable enough to do it or, or maybe not. I'm, I'm saying it out loud. I didn't have the mental capacity to do it. Right. right. I didn't have the me mental capacity to be like, I just got to let that one go. You know, right. like that doesn't have to be the best version of the arm that you've ever seen. I got 22 pages to get this right. You know? Yeah. And until I came to terms with that, there was no way for me to sort of like draw quote unquote faster. Now would I have been able to do cybernary faster hell yeah i have that level of confidence to be like that panel's not really all that important you know right right that takes i would think just uh you know but that takes experience you know that takes actual application that's not just all about what's between your ears it's it's you know you have to know all the quote unquote sheets because you've tried them right and then from there go like oh yep i'm not going to draw that because that takes way too much. You know who did have that was Dustin. I yeah. criticize, yeah, Dustin Wen, good buddy of mine. I would look at his pages sometimes and I'd be like, whoa, this, that looks a little light on, on detail. Or like what you come to know Dustin whenever he's doing like, let's say a cover, right? Right. But Dustin had it right. Dustin knew, hey, I can't do this page in, page out, month in, month out and hope to deliver this book on time, right? He understood the, uh, the economics of what it meant to be, you know, a full-time comic book artist. Um, so much more than I ever did, you know? Yeah. So I, uh, looking back, I, I had a ton of respect for him back then, but even more so when I realized, oh, right, he was doing it right, you know? Yeah, I mean, he he's exactly what you said. He, he's made a great living as a comic book artist. Yep. Yeah. I want to, um, you said something on the episode that I fucked up. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember how, how you, you, you put it. But we were talking about page design. Yeah. And you just sort of rerouted my whole thinking process. I had spent so many years... <laughs> Um, and, and you also kind of explained why I thought this way, which I didn't even realize. I had spent so many years like really focused on page design and creating these really interesting design pages that you, yeah. would lead your eye from panel to panel in an interesting yeah. way, and yeah, and uh, and then you had you were talking about it. You had said like that's that's for artists that's not for readers yeah yeah i think i i think i remember that portion of our conversation so like page design is so oh, like page layouts right when you're going to a comic book uh, convention when people are like looking through your portfolio and you're getting your view people who know how to like tell a story know how to lay out a page at least in theory in such a way that it's it's easy to guide them through how to read it, right? Right. Makes sense. Um, left to right, then diagonally down, back to the left, and left to right again, in as much as you would read a sentence in a book, right? Makes right. a lot of sense. That's a very natural eye movement. That's cool. And I think if done well, right? Um, uh, I think if it's done well and, and it's in the hands of a person who's very mindful of that, makes total sense, right? The other way, um, is just to make it as simple as possible for them to follow along, right? Because 
in as much as reading is concerned, like the, to immediately drag the comparison of like, oh yeah, it's like reading a book, right? It's not, it's really not. It's not as simple as like left to right, diagonally back to down and left and then left to right again. It, yeah, in theory, in application, it's still a massive, uh, um, um, what do you call this? It's like a massive leap of faith to make sure that it reads correctly. Yeah. Right. Now it takes people some time to ramp up to that. And I'm not, I'm not discounting people's ability to be able to catch up, but each person has their different way of, uh, or different speeds where they can ramp up how to be able to read a comic book. My attitude is I take away, I, I take that all off the table. I make it so that you're looking at it one picture at a time. Right. Yeah. bound by the panel borders, right? And thankfully for Chrononauts, um, Chrononauts 2, Millar allowed maybe six, as many as six, as many as six panels at any given time. But for the most part, it was like four or five. And it really allowed me to draw the images, you know? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's with, a good thing. Without worrying about, oh, I've got to do a tight close-up on his face here. And I've got to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I did all of those things, tight close-up, but it was never to the to the um, expectation of somebody who was an expert at reading comics. Because wow. my attitude is you want to break down that barrier of entry to somebody who doesn't know how to read a book. I, I just heard this on somebody's podcast the other day. They were like, I had to explain to somebody how to read a comic book page, and it never dawned on me because I'm a veteran comic book reader, how to do it, all right? Right. And you're like, yeah, some, even veterans have a hard time sometimes, depending on the artist, following along what the intent is as far as storytelling. Now, can you imagine somebody that's brand new at it? Right. And with Chrononauts, I made the general assumption that people who are reading that book have never read a comic before. And that's one of the things that I implemented was I'm not going to try to do too many insert panels that's independent of what they, what the... Um, independent of what the shot is, right? A bit independent of what the storytelling intent is going to be. And thankfully, uh, Millar's writing, Millar's script was so uh, accommodating to that idea. He kept everything to like five panels. Sometimes it went to six, you know? Right. But yeah, I think that there's that, that's that barrier of entry as far as storytelling is concerned. We see like we over-design a page, right? Like, yeah. oh man, this feels really, really good by Mobius standards, which to me is like, damn, that's pretty awesome, right? Right. But to a to a to a person, to a regular person that's buying it, that's not as comic book savvy as you are, it might be, you know, you might have outsmarted them, right? Right. You might right. Have outsmarted yourself in that exercise. And and when you explain that to me, it just, I I agree, I agree. Yeah. Because I've been thinking more and more about <clears throat> really just putting my comics out in, in ways that I can reach more and more people yeah. by putting it on the phone and keeping it simple and all, all these things that I would have wouldn't have done before. I'm now like I want. I think that's the way to go now. Yeah, dude. Like, there's a reason why historically, and maybe people find it boring, but whatever. But its effectiveness is undeniable. There's a reason why, like, a nine-panel grid worked. You know, why a six-panel grid on a comic book page worked. Right. People were like, in Chrononauts two, I rarely broke panel. Rarely, rarely broke panel. You know, because I was like, why? What? Why am I truly intending by breaking panel? You know, what does it mean? Um, does it give, does it turn this shot from a C minus to an A plus? Right. Or does it turn this shot from a C minus to a C? Oh, that's neat that you broke panel, but it doesn't really, it's not conducive to the story. It doesn't right. allow me to be like, what am I, who am I trying to fool with uh, the three dimensionalness of this breaking panel by, by, you know, am I bamboozling you away from the fact that this is a two-dimensional medium that doesn't make any sense to me? Right. So just, I, I always say opt for clarity. Opt for as much clarity as possible, right? Some people have theorized, oh yeah, you break panel because it leads your eye to the next panel that you, that you want your reader to go. I'm like, yeah, okay, I guess in concept, yeah, sure. But in exercise, does everybody know how to do that correctly? No. Right. 
Yeah, well, you got me thinking different. <laughs> I'm sure but that's good. Well, let's implement if if it's if it's feasible and usable. Just abandon if it's not usable for you. I've seen a lot of different pages. Um, um, like two years ago, I was reading. I was re I was reading a lot of different comics just to get sort of like, you know, mentally caught up. Because if I'm going to level of uh, if I'm going to put a certain level of criticism on on an industry, I'd rather know from personal experience that it's coming from an informed place right not just like oh i remember this back in the day and back in the days like 10 years ago comics doesn't even look like that anymore right? right so i went and bought a few and i was like huh yep nope same problematic <laughs> same problematic storytelling concepts same problematic of like you know um and it made me it made me wonder um, again, as far as stewardship is concerned, who is at the front end of hiring some of these guys, right? Because there's a lot of metrics that allow you to be a comic book artist the first time. Um, I don't know if storytelling is near the top anymore. Often, That's, Yeah, I know, would say I don't think it is. Yeah, I, I would say that it was like, how do you move units, right? <laughs> right, I think everything's about that now. Right. But Which makes sense. I, I'm not I'm not belittling it. I'm not making fun of it. I'm certainly no, looking at I it from a perspective. It, like, it just gets back to your initial statement i don't remember your exact words but just maintaining like yep. the business not expanding yep. or growing it yeah i don't know if, i don't know if it's truth be told i don't know if they can <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know if they can and and so w based on that attitude right um um you know it is smart to go into the maintenance business right like right. How much more? How much more coke can you put out into the world at this point? Right. Right. Anyway, Jim Lee is a great uh, is a great um, person to sort of like be inspired, at least for me, be be inspired by when in regards to doing these tribute covers, because sometimes he lands something so perfectly. And in regards to this X Men uh, two sixty eight cover. I'm like, fuck, man, this is really good. Really simple, really straightforward. Um, how can I, how can I add a flavor to this? You know, right now during that era, was he your favorite Marvel artist, X Men artist? Dude, heck yeah, heck yeah. I mean, he it's strange. It, there, there was always two. There was two people that I was looking at because I was able to then then start to afford like back issues, right? Right. So it was between Jim Lee and and Paul Smith. Okay. It's Paul Smith of like old vintage, uh, older vintage X Men run, right? Yeah. And and then Jim Lee for current. But you say he he wasn't your uh, he was. No, your I, I liked it a lot. I really enjoyed yeah. Jim Lee, but I, I um around that time there was also um, Mark Silvestri was drawing the other title. Like yeah, Jim Lee was Wolverine. on X Men mm -hmm. and Mark was on Uncanny. I no, no, no. Jim Jim was on, but when when Jim came on to Uncanny, Mark moved over to Wolverine. Right, right. Oh, that stuff with Dan Green inking. That's beautiful stuff. Right, right. And right. and I didn't appreciate Mark's. Oh, I appreciated Mark's when he was doing his his X Men run. Uh, but I did not appreciate his, the totality of his work until much, much later on. Uh, you know, like you, the example that you just gave is just Dan Green, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't appreciate that stuff until much, much later. Um, but yeah, I preferred Silvestri. I preferred Pacheco. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now, why Why those two in specific? What, what sort of drew you into their work? Um, I felt Jim... Like he had a definite style, but it was like more style, like style over substance. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. I felt like Pacheco was a, a much stronger anatomical figurative artist. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, you're not alone in that. My um, my one of my best friends, Sam Liu, director of Burt Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. huge Pacheco fan, huge, huge, huge Pacheco fan for the same exact reason that you just mentioned right now. Which yeah, is like, I mean, he I felt like anatomically he 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 didn't he didn't like tower over uh jim but certainly it was a preference it was a preference. yeah yeah i mean i did enjoy it and then i i preferred joe mad and that goes against what i just said because 
<laughs> was all style and balls, but it was right. more balls than gym. It was just right. there was so much power and energy and, and fucking badassness to his right. trunk. He's still one of my favorite artists. Yeah, I think that comes from just like, you know, Joe was what, like 12 when he was Drew for yeah. X-Men, right? He was like a kid. Yeah. And I think that just comes from like an irreverent of, uh, attitude of like, hey, I'm drawing X-Men. This stuff is cool. I'm not going to, I'm not paying attention to whatever else came before right. me. No, I'm just going to no, draw no, no. this shit, you know? It was just about cool drawings. Yeah. But again, I, I didn't feel like, like I also at the time, I mean, Frank Miller was my favorite. So it's like, I, I wasn't putting, like I wasn't reading a Jim Lee comic, like being blown away by storytelling or story. That's what Frank's comics were doing for me. And, right. and, and other artists like that. But no. Jim was, I'm with you. I'm with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jim was, I, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed the X-Men pre Jim. So I was definitely in there for the story of it all. Right. Yeah. But, you know, when, when, so it, it was very, for me, it was ideal that Jim came on board and added that extra oomph. Right. right. Um, and that's not putting any sort of shade towards like what much Mark Silvestri had done before Jim arrived. Right. Right, right. But when Jim came in, I was like, holy fuck, what is this? You know, why is this so good? Yeah, I mean, it was brand new. But I, at the time, I was also just in terms of like superhero team comics. Simonson was was my my guy. Yeah, really? Yeah, he was on X Factor. Right. right and that right, was right. like my favorite title. People have made comparisons to my work and his. And it doesn't go unappreciated, but sometimes I'm really surprised because I wouldn't say that he was uh, an influence of mine. You know, like I wouldn't say that I looked to his comics and was like, yeah, you know, Mighty Thor. I really, I was really into that, you know? Right, right. I it's a I've... fast, like maybe they're they're picking up on the energy or something like that, but I it's wonder always too, been a puzzle. Because I have too. heard that at conventions, people come up and say that and I've, yeah. it's made me think. Like, what are they seeing? Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. All right. We're going to put everything in his, his Captain America crotch area in shadow. Just <laughs> like Jim did. Uh, I'm going to be silent for a second because I got some light little brushwork to do and that takes full focus. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, like, so no, no talking at all, Sean. We're just going to. No, I was just, you can talk. I was just explaining my silence. Oh, I thought you were like, shut up, shut up. I got to. No, no, no. I was just. I got to do this bit of genius that's happening right here. I wouldn't call it genius. I would call it concentration. (laughs) That's, that's how you'd call it between the lines as I'm reading through them. You know, shut up, Eric. Shut up, shut up. So you realize that comics were not the way to make a living. Sure. Sure, and seemingly beneficially, it's a lot sooner than you did. Yes. Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. I, oh, we we established earlier. I have the. I, I'm stubborn, and when an idea gets in my head, I just. Stick yeah, it. sure. Um, this time it worked to to the detriment to your own to your personal. It, detriment. it was a lesson. No, it was a lesson. It was a <laughs> lesson learned. That's right. That's, that's the way. To, that's the perfect way to look at it. Always positive. <laughs> oh yeah, it dawned on me that. It wasn't uh, at the very, it was creatively fulfilling. It was not financially viable. And at that point in my life, it wasn't, it wasn't feasible for me to continue in comics. It just wasn't. It was, you know, it would be so irresponsible financially to keep, yes. to keep doing comics. Um, As I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sean. Um, yeah so it just it would just it would not be very smart for me to continue and some people you know I I so it was better for me to step away as best as I could and um, uh, and try to leave as much of a positive leave on a positive note than to like continue and then obviously get financially burned out and then ultimately professionally burned out right right so it was better so, to step away. So what did you do to leave on a positive note? Like, what does that mean? Well, I tried to, as best as I could, like, put, 
put a nice bow on all the projects that I was working on comics wise. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, yeah, because I just knew like there's a level of professionalism, maybe not implicit, but or explicit, but definitely implied at when you're working at Wildstorm, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like if if there's things that's on your plate and you gotta, and those things have to be um, fulfilled, right? There's a deadline. People are waiting on you. Try to put that to bed. So at, at some point I excused myself from Wildstorm uh, because I had gotten a job back in LA and you know there were still some things I needed to finish there were still deadlines that I had I hadn't hit yet Mm -hmm. so I went and I wanted to make sure that those deadlines were hit as best as I could I tried not to rush the project and um, there was a uh, there was a good chunk of time there uh, until I finished those deadlines or until I finished my wild storm commitments that I was, I was literally burning the candles at both ends uh, uh, to do my nine to five and then go home and, and do comic stuff, you know? That was me in the teaching years. Yeah. I know. That's oh like... yeah. I don't know how you did that, man. That um, sounds great. Uh, yeah. That sounds I, fucking nuts. It was, it was absolutely insane and it fucking ate me alive and almost cost me a marriage, my sanity, and everything. Yeah. Um, so when you left, um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to change the topic. If if you have yeah. questions on what I just said, I'm happy to answer. But no, no, no. I was just thinking along the lines of, um, who did you have to go in, in into Wildstorm and say, "Hey, I'm going to be leaving." Do you remember that? Probably my editor. I mean, this was a little a little while ago. I, I remember this specifically a call that I had gotten from Jim because he had thought I'd left before fulfilling my fulfilling my obligations to Wildstorm. And I had gotten that call from him while I was working my nine to five at this other job. And it was such a like he's the guy that took a huge, huge chance on me. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, they. Wa- I, I, I'm still, and I, I think Dustin Newman can corroborate this. But you know, they wanted Dustin, right? They didn't want me. At least I don't think so. You know, it was through Dustin, you know, putting in a good word for me, saying, "Hey, you should take a chance on this guy," right? So, and you when they knew Dustin did, before that, I knew because we started going into the studio. We lived relatively in, in like adjacent towns in Los Angeles, Southern California, right? And so when, when we'd end up at Wildstorm together, we'd end up talking like, hey, where, you know, what town do you live in? Where do you live? And so on. And like, oh, we come from effectively the same place, right? Uh-huh. So we knew each other that way you know, before, before we became really, really good friends. But I suspect, and I, I think this is true, I'm under the impression that Justin really, uh, Dustin really did um, vouch for me with Wildstorm's front offices because they really wanted him. Right. Okay. But with me, they were unsure. I don't think my style was very viable for them as a business. Made sense. Totally made sense to me. But when he put up for me and people, people said, okay, well, he's, a, he's an employee here now, right? Uh-huh. They did not back away from that commitment, right? Um, at the front end of that commitment was Jim Lee. He always vied for, he always vouched for and supported the stuff that I had done. I mean, we all worked in the pit together um, and that was when Jim started drawing Hush right around that time. Yes. I, I was so when, visiting Wildstorm at that time. I just finished my job and it was right before San Diego Comic Con. I came out. No, you were not there. Dustin was not there, but I remember Dustin's desk was set up and I think yours in Bermejo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he never backed away from that support. And, and I've, I've been, I think, a, so very grateful for that, right? Internally grateful for that. I, I'm, I can't say enough about the, the sort of handholding that he gave me, right? Professional handholding that he gave me mm-hmm. in regards to making sure that, you know, anything that was blocking the way of me doing my best work was out of the way, right? And so when I had left, and again, it was pro- the people that I had talked to was probably my editor, probably Jim, um, and I can't remember who else. I think Scott Dunby was there, so I probably had to say, hey, Scott, thank you for your time. Thank right. you for your support. Um, but anyway, 
I remember getting a call from Jim saying, uh, and this is probably, it, this isn't in verbatim, but the spirit of it was, hey, you left and you still had deadlines here. You left and there, there's still a, a, um, a sum to be paid because when you were, when you were a full-time um, uh, employee of Wildstorm, effectively you're a full-time employee of DC Comics, which was, they're playing you a weekly salary um, in, in lieu of you turning in those pages. Does that make sense, Sean? Like whatever weekly salary that you made, yeah. that's the expectancy of pages that you needed to turn in, right? right? Made a lot of sense, right? It's, it's just one way for paying you your page, right? Another way of paying you your page, right? But at one point, um, I got so behind that there was this sort of like, you know, there was this deficit of pages that had been turned in versus what I was paid. I think that's how that goes, right? Okay. And so when I had left, that's when, you know, that's what, what, that's what Jim was referring to. It was like, hey, we had paid you X amount. These pages aren't still, these pages still aren't done. And I was so sort of like, I, I, I was, man, that, that really did sort of like scare me that Jim would think that kind of thought of me, that I would just leave without fulfilling my obligations. So much so that I left work <laughs> on the spot like my nine to five, I left on the spot, took that two hour drive from Southern California to San Diego or from Los Angeles to San Diego, just to talk to Jim face to face about what had happened, you know, uh -huh. just to say, Hey, I'm still going to work on this. I'm not abandoning it. You know? Right. Was he pissed? He was, he's, no, he wasn't pissed. He was just like holding me accountable, you right. know? Right. Um, and as he should, right? Like he's, right. he's a, he should, he's the publisher, you know? Right. Um, and yeah, to his credit, he, he took the time to talk to me, which is great. Right. So I never, yeah, I didn't leave there on bad terms. I've, I'd heard a few people who had, and that's what sort of was like, you know, putting the fear of God into me to never, ever do it. Right. Right. So. So, and you, I mean, I've seen Jim come by your table. You guys are good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 friendly with the guy. You're a rock star. Nah, nah. <laughs> I'm just a guy who got like a ton of great chances, and if I had, I would think if I still had the gusto to do it today, um, uh, I think I would make a viable career doing comics. My heart's just not in it, you know, like. What changed? What, why is your heart not in it now? I think the spirit of comics has changed. Yeah. Right? There's a handful of books that still capture it. Don't get me wrong. There's still a handful of books that understand, like, what it's ultimately trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Tell these great stories. But I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's there anymore. Um, at least in the experience, in the X amount that I've read. So when I was reading, it, it, it took a handful of my friends to actually calibrate me to like the books that they knew that I would appreciate you know mm -hmm. and so when I when I sought those out I was like oh yeah it's still that still exists but I think it's it's a combination of how I perceived what that spirit had changed into and also understanding how the um how the sausages were made so to speak right right where I was like oh well, that's uh, that's less glamorous now, you know, right. that's, that's not as cool as I thought it was. And then ultimately it really still needed to be like the love of it. Nothing, nothing really made me swear off of it. Right. I still, obviously, or else I wouldn't have been doing stuff with Millar. Right. Right. Regardless of what he paid me. But, but, uh, as far as mainstream stuff is concerned, I have, my experiences of comics as I was collecting them are the stuff that I choose to hold on to, right? right. That nostalgia is what I choose to hold on to. None of the uh, very less of current stuff. Do you remember what it was that people recommended you read that you enjoyed? Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a, there was this was years ago. So keep in mind, I still need to catch yeah, up was again. What time? What, what time? Um, Gosh, it was when I can't remember which Spider-Man series it was when Doctor Octopus went was inside Peter's head, right? What is, is that, that? Ramos drawing that stuff? No, no, it was it was somebody else. But effectively, like, 
the story was about, uh, you know, it picked up right after a big event where Peter died or some shit like that. Right. And like, yeah, I remember this. When, when he woke up, you know, Dr. Octopus was in his head and he was conduct. He was basically acting like he's, he was Peter Parker. Right. That was, that was interesting. That was super fun to read along. Like, Oh yeah, this is just, I don't know why this needed to be a new series. I don't know why this just couldn't be the regulars within the regular Spider-Man books, because you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, if Todd McFarlane had drawn this book, this would feel exactly like one of those stories that he that he was involved with back when he was still drawing Spider Man. You know, right? So, right. so yeah, that felt very of that era, Todd McFarlane ish. You know, so that felt good. Um, I can't remember all the other ones. Hmm. Oh, when oh gosh, this is given, but you know, this was even before that. But I remember reading Uncanny X Force when Reminder and um oh and jerome and jerome were on it and i was like fuck these guys <laughs> Res- <laughs> respectfully fuck these guys because i think rick got it rick understood the nostalgia button that he was trying to press with with that with that run you know right and so yeah that it was those kinds of they still existed but rare were they the main point anymore you know right um and I can't speak too much to DC because I've never been much of a DC guy as yeah, a kid same. in the Philippines. That's what's what I read were DC comics. But when I started getting heavy into uh, reading comic books in the US, I'd been, always been a Marvel dude. So um, I never got a chance to uh, give much DC, uh, much DC stuff a read through, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, was, I didn't grow up. I, I never really enjoyed that man i like batman but never a big dc guy yeah but even then like I, you know i was reading i read batman recently versus what i read batman for back in the day which is like bane is showing up fucking breaking backs and you know like right. you know like Azrael coming in and like you know giving Batman a good run for his money. That's the kind of Batman shit I grew up with. I, grew, I read Batman now. I'm like, oh, there's, there, there's probably an audience for this, you know? Mm-hmm. That audience is not me. Right, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to render a vinyl, and it's a little... Yeah, how's your little... thing coming? I gotta actually... I All right. Did I even turn on the camera? <laughs> I don't even know at this point. Did I turn on the camera? Did I forget to turn on the camera? Dude, you are banging these covers out like every day. You've got a new one. It's crazy. You're you're out. I there. try to, but see, this is this experience, especially when I'm into it. Now, that's something that I can't begin to explain whether or not it's sustainable. It's things like this that make me go like, oh yeah, if I wanted to draw comics, I could, you know. But keep in mind, this is on a cover that I'm super into. What about those pages where I'm kind of like, oh, I'm boring as this shit, you know? Right. Right. So I can't account for that. But in as far as speed is concerned, being able to, the physical act of drawing, I'm like, yeah, I can draw comics. Yeah, it's amazing what you're getting done in the time you're doing it. I mean, it's amazing anyways, but then you put that into it. Fucking crazy. It's an exercise. I think animation has taught me a lot. More importantly, like, you know, when doing animation, I would have like storyboard you know, 300 somewhat storyboard pages, three panels each, you know, it's 900 drawings, right? Like it gave me the moment of, uh, this moment of clarity of like, uh, not every drawing has to be perfect. It just needs to be able to communicate. Now in comics, I slow down a little bit more, obviously, Mm -hmm. right? Drawings need to be a little bit more polished than storyboards, but, you know, same attitude, which is like, you know, does this read as vinyl? right or in the case of like panel to panel work like what what was the writer like that was an interesting exercise for with working with mark was like i know i have to facilitate a certain level of speed and by the way that still took me like 12 months to draw because i was working a regular nine to five right but like i had to really you don't know how i did comics and teaching full-time but you just did that yeah, but they gave me such a huge lead, you know? Like, you were working monthly, no? No. Oh, God, no. Oh. The fastest okay. I was, the fastest I did an issue, I think, was five weeks. 
Oh, okay. But still, you know, month and a half or a month and a week, you know. It was mainly six week schedules, but they were killing me. There you go. I didn't do that. <laughs> My delivery was like for chrononauts was something like three and a half, maybe as many as four per week at most. And that's pushing it, right? Like I had an extra weekend to myself and I would, or it was a particularly easy page, whatever. Right. But I could, there was no way I could maintain, you know, a, a five week schedule. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, the reason why that was such an enjoyable experience in as far as like the, the drawing part is uh, the difference of who I was drawing Cybernary versus the, or the drawings that, or the artist that I was on Cybernary and the drawings that I was doing for that book and the artist that I was on, on Chrononauts 2 and how I was drawing that book was simply because I, I had a, a better grasp of, of sort of like looking at the page, looking at the scene description and then asking myself, like, what's the intent of this? You know, right? like, what's the intent of this panel? What's the intent of these sequence of panels? What's the in intent of these pages and sequence of pages? Right. And I wasn't beholden to drawing the best thing. I just kind of drew it. Right. As long as I landed, landed intent, I think I was doing my job to service the story. Okay. I took all the hoity toity artist shit out of my, <laughs> out of the process and was just like, let's just draw this thing. Let's just draw it. It'll be fine. It'll work out. For sure, it crept in once in a while. I'm like, oh, that eyeball is off, you know, or like that pose is a little janky. But right. ultimately, it was like, how do I help tell the story? Right. And that was liberating. I had so much fun because on Cybernary, it had to be, or like when mainstream comics, I had to be like, oh man, this has to be the coolest pose. This, you know, like I'd refer yes. back to all the I've people always... that I, uh, that I hold, held as heroes or, or, you know, influences and be like, oh, that one time so-and-so drew this panel. I want to capture that somehow. Yeah. And I always I'd forgotten, comics. you know, that's good. I mean, that's kind of where I am now. I want to, do more i want to do some create your own comics and just tell the story cleanly and make it i mean i want the drawings i don't want the drawings to look shitty but i don't need to try to like break my back on every panel there you go that's been the saving grace for me in recent time which which is funny because when i drew um when i drew uh enter the mandarin right yes that was the same attitude that i took was just like whatever i'm just going to draw right somewhere along the way i got lost it started to become about like all these damn pretty pictures you know yeah but but i guess to counter your your argument a bit that's a that's a beautiful piece of comics work that i look at all the time which the which is what the Mandarin, the Mandarin stuff? No, no, no. That's what I'm getting at. Is that I the, I was still implementing the attitude of like how do I or as early as then I was implementing the attitude of like how do I best sell, service the story, mm -hmm. right? Somewhere after that, I started to become oh, more that. precious about it. You know, like why did I do that? that yeah, that was so say, counterintuitive I mean, in my career. You know. I can't imagine having the skill to be able to do the Mandarin and it be me not making it so trying to break my back on it. Because it looks like, to me, like every panel is just a fucking masterpiece. Thanks, dude. But see, see that? Like, you look at it from the outside looking in and you're like, masterpiece. Back then, I was just like, let me just draw this. Right. Because I, work, I was working on an animated series back then. You know, like there was no time to be precious about it. I just needed to get it out. And, and that really did serve to sort of like put the essential things on the page, right? To put the most communicative things on the page and right. move forward from that. It stopped. It wasn't about the exercise of drawing pretty pictures. The pretty pictures were, if they happened, was like, well, that's great. That's cool. You know, masterpiece, whatever, what have you. But really it was just like let's get this out because we're now dealing with four deadlines you know do you remember what you were what animation you were working on at the time yeah at that time i was working on ben 10 for cartoon network okay yeah, yeah i remember when the you know that was like when you know gosh 
when did like that was right around the time that the first Iron Man movie came out. Right. Right. So because I remember them not being overly precious about my deadlines. Uh, there were still deadlines, right? And they were still a lot tighter than what I had done on Chrononauts 2 recently. But they weren't precious about it. When the movie came out and was such a blockbuster success, that's when my editors were like, Eric, you need to get, you, this needs to come out sooner rather than later because we want to be able to take advantage of the heat that the movie is getting. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so did you speed up? Huh? No, <laughs> there was there was no way for me to have sped up even if I wanted to. I was already doing right. the bare bones version of my style, but the only thing that couldn't that was preventing me from outputting more was the fact that I was working a nine to five. Right, right. Fuck, man. So, are we, what what were we gonna say? I was gonna say, where are we time wise? You okay? Yeah, yeah. Why do you gotta go? No, no, I'm not. I'm in no rush. No, I was thinking about taking a break soon just to go to the bathroom, hitting pause. All right. Huh. Then, well, you're almost done inking. This might be a good time to sign off, no? Um, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah. Yeah, let me see where you're at. You, I mean, you got a ton of work. Yeah, I mean, look, the goal is not to finish it during the podcast, it's just to work on it. Yeah, what I will do is... Right. And when, when you're done, if you can send me a high res scan of it, I can put it at the end of the video. So the finished pieces will be at the end. 100%. Um, all right. Well, before we, we sign off, let me switch my camera real quick to say goodbye. Dude, my... You know what freaks people out a lot is when I uh, do not use a brush to get rid of the pen eraser shavings on the page. I do. I do the same exact thing. <laughs> I have it. Mine's. Uh, in fact, let me before I switch my camera. Let me show you. Right, right. Look how much. Look how. Look how not new that uh, that brush is. That's great. That brush has has seen some projects, man. There's magnetic tape on one side to hold it up to my table. <laughs> How are you, what is your setup like on your table? Is it like a magnetic roll? Is what a magnetic roll? Like how are you sticking magnets onto your table? It's a metal table. Uh... It's got, it, it's an old drafting table from an architectural firm. So it's gotcha. got this like, I don't know what the material is on top of the metal. It yeah. has a little bit of give to it. Not not that you could press it and feel it, but you're not drawing directly on metal. Right. Um, but the metal's right below it, so everything on my table is magnets. Awesome. Lucky. And now I'm back on camera. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you, Eric, for doing this. This has been a yeah. good time. Thanks for uh, chit-chatting with me. Is there anything you wanted to promote or announce or social media? Yeah, stuff? I want to. I want to promote you doing this new podcast, buddy. Congratulations! Thank you, thank you. As far as social media is concerned, you can look up my stuff on uh, Instagram.com forward slash Eric Canetti. That's that's pretty much where I keep, where I do a lot of my main social media updates. Or probably is Twitter too. But yeah, Instagram first, Twitter next. All right. Thank you. And everyone listening, uh, can you do me a favor? If you're watching this on YouTube, which is probably where you're watching it, hit that little subscribe button, like the episode and leave a comment if you will. And uh, if you're not already following me, follow me on all my social media at Ink Pulp. And one last thing is I do have a GoFundMe campaign going on for the podcast. Just uh, I want to try to pay my my producer who puts a lot of time into these episodes and uh, all the new equipment and stuff like that. So if you awesome. have a few extra dollars, if you could go donate some, that'd be awesome. The link is below in the comments. So thank you again. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sean. This has been another awesome episode of the Ink Pulp Podcast. Thanks, man. Thank you for having me.